Lord, we, um, we line ourselves up with the people of God throughout, the, throughout history. This people that you gave hints to early on. People like Adam and Eve and Abel. Enoch, who followed after you. Noah, who was righteous in his time. And in, in, in the fullness, Abraham, Sarah, you called them out of where they were at and called them to be a peculiar people, a different people. Called them into a place that they didn't know to trust you, to move in faith to believe that you had good purposes for them, that you would not see them abandoned. Lord, we we follow our faith journey back through these players, you know, through through Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and, and the tribes, through Moses and Aaron and Miriam, and then into Joshua and the taking of a a land promised to them. And kings, some good, many not. We trace our heritage through Prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah, people who spoke of you and promised that there was a God out there who loved us, who created us, who fashioned us. David, Daniel, and Ruth, and Naomi. And we, uh, we just want to say that we came here this morning, not because, I don't know, we're geniuses, but we came at your invitation. We are here in the same way that you invited Abraham and Sarah, you invite us. In the same way that you invited Abraham at the burning bush, you invited us. In the same way that you spoke to Hagar in the, in the desert, and you spoke to her, and, say, and, and she, she, I, you said, I see you. She named you the God who sees me. In the very same way, we're here. We're just um, people who believe that there is a God who loves us, who's come after us. And greatest example of that, Jesus, is you. And when you put aside, somehow, we don't completely get it, some piece of certainly equality with God and come and step into this planet, this insignificant rock, that's spinning and orbiting around a fairly insignificant star by cosmic comparison, and you say, here I am. Here I am. Here are the purposes I have for you. Here's the way to live. And here's what I'm going to do to sin. Here's what I'm going to do to death so that we can be together forever. It's, it's a, man, it's a Hollywood couldn't touch this script. Couldn't get close. So here we are as a people who are called by your name, pursued by you, chance this morning to speak of our gratitude and to hear of your goodness, and chance to live again this week in the hope of the confidence, the joy that you've given to us. So we, we, we commit ourselves into that. Lord, we're on a planet that is uh, that's in the midst of a pandemic. Uh, we've been in the midst of world wars in the past, devastating, it's wrong. In the middle of now a pandemic, we're Certain places are doing okay, and other places are in uh, catastrophic freefall. And so we lift up this planet before you and say, God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let there be healing and wholeness for, for the world. Let there be kindness and goodness in places where people are growing thin and lean with patience. Lord, we pray for truth to out. More importantly, we pray that love bears out. We are, a, we are a country, Jesus, who are going into uh, a, an election tomorrow, federal election, casting votes, and so we ask for wisdom to be able to do that in a way. We do ask for whichever leader, whichever party is the successful ones. We pray for humility and wisdom for them to lead us in a pandemic, and, and beyond that, just leading a country's pretty high, pretty tall ask, pretty, pretty large request. And so we pray for wisdom for that person, humility to lead before you, um, we would long for laws to be passed and justice to be served and kindness to be extended along the lines that you um, speak of these things. So we, we give these folks to you, leaders of all the different parties. We pray for civil discourse, for kindness and respect in the midst of disagreement. Lord, our world needs this, and uh, we ask it also for ourselves. So now we are hitting, sitting before you. You say that um, you are shepherd and we're sheep, and, and we actually have a chance to, to learn, to be educated, and so we pray that you would, in fact, do that. Speak to us words that we wouldn't have for ourselves, words maybe that we once knew and have now forgotten. We pray you'd speak again right now into, boom, our souls, right here in the chest cavity. In your name we pray, in the strong name of Jesus, amen. Okay, Philippians 1, and I'm going to read, I think it's from verse 27, hopefully. Hey, Pat, that's good. We're going to go to the end of 30. Beautiful. Okay, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm 
in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. Since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had and now hear that I still have. Okay, outside this building, outside the four doors, right there there's a brick, there's a cornerstone and it reads, Jesus is Lord. You may walk by it and never pay attention to it. Every time I go by it, it kind of gives me like a shudder. It kind of goes through my system. It, that's a statement that got a lot of people into trouble. In fact, it's a statement that got a lot of people dead over the years. Jesus is Lord, and we decided we put it on the outside of our building and say, this is what we're about inside here. Jesus is Lord. It's what got Paul into prison. It's what put him there. See, I've told you this before, but the common greeting back in Paul's day was, Caesar is Lord. Caesar is Lord. Now, it was not like what we do. Hey, man, I was gone. That's not that. It was like Caesar is Lord. And you would use that just as an expression of allegiance to the throne, bow and scrape to the latest narcissist, and then you keep your life and get on with your day. Caesar is Lord. Paul refused. Not happening. To the contrary, Paul had become convinced that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is king. And, and then that the resurrection sealed that title. And Jesus kicked off a whole new kingdom that was going to be a new society of which he was king. And the Roman Empire and any other empire that would follow that empire was chopped liver compared to the kingdom that Jesus had going. Caesar was an imposter. Caesar was an imposter. Real king is Jesus. Caesar was making a claim to something that he could never actually have. He's a man. At best, he's going to live to 70 years old. He's going to bald. He's going to lose his hair. Caesar is God. Come on, when he gets really old, his prostate's going to fail and he's going to dribble his urine down on his socks. That's a God, right? That's not going to work. Caesar Augustus lived, I think, 75. Julius Caesar lived to 56. Nero lived to 30. Like these gods? Caesar is God? Caesar is king? I don't think so. Paul couldn't bear it. Stay in your lane, Caesar. You can be emperor of the Roman Empire for a few years, but you're not lord. You're not king. Well, you can guess how well that went over. Christians refusing to say Caesar is Lord, refusing to say, you're not a real king, Jesus is king. Well, there are numbers of people that did actually believe that Jesus is king and how he was finally this long-awaited and, and long-promised Messiah. And these groups of people came together and they heard the story about Jesus, who taught brilliantly. We read some of his Proverbs just a, just a few weeks ago. Who healed the broken, who could point out the very sickness of sick religion who did not force his way with people, who did not jam people who didn't like him, who loved actually the hated. Those things all came together on Easter weekend when Jesus confronted the two great troublers of the human race, sin and death. And so, like you, many of you for sure, people believed. They said, I want in on that. I want in on that kingdom, not that one. I want in on this Jesus kingdom. So they were still like Roman citizens or citizens of Israel, but more importantly, they were citizens of this new kingdom that Jesus has started, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, a new society that formed hope around their king, was Jesus. If you're a believer in Jesus here this morning, then you're in to this. This is your new society, your new citizenship. If you're not a believer in Jesus, then I think what you're doing here is you're kicking the tires to find out if there's any truth to the claims that Jesus made. So good for you. Good that you're here, both of you. Okay, so with that explanation, you would think that Christians are wonderful people and super easy to get along with, right? You know, we are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. It's all coming together beautifully. Christians are just a lot, a lot of fun. Newsflash, we can suck at times. We do. We're not so great at it. And it, it breaks my heart any time that a church breaks apart. That church has troubles. We've had some troubles here at times, and every time it breaks my heart for us here. And the church in Philippi seemed to be having some troubles too. They got a lot of things right. They would pray for Paul. They sent a neat, generous gift to Paul. Um, they were cheering for, the, for, for a lot of good things. They prayed, and they gave, and they served. But they got two things that seemed like maybe Paul was at least trying to speak to them. And the one was they were having a hard time getting along with each other. Rats. 
And we're going to tackle that one next week. Um, but this week was the first problem. The first problem was they're having a hard time knowing how to be together in front of the world. How are we us and the world's looking on? How are we us when we are out there? That's the challenge. So people gathered. People believed. They got together in the same town. They, were, they called themselves a church. In Greek, it's ekklesia. It actually means called out ones. It means different ones. So you say, well, we're going to church. Well, church isn't actually a building. Um, that's not it. We're going to church on Sunday morning. It's not really an activity. It's us. Church is a people. It's this new society that's formed up for, for us. Okay, so this first struggle, how do we get along with the world? How do we do our stuff? And, and Paul says it this way, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner that's worthy of the gospel. Scholar N.T. Wright He translates a verse like this. One thing I would stress to you, your public behavior must line up with the gospel of the king. You get it? How you are on the outside, right, needs to measure up and point to the fact that Jesus is king. Okay, everything lines up with that. I'm married. I'm happily married. Actually, it turns out I'm married out of my league. She's pretty awesome. She's super wonderful. But that only, it only counts when I'm on the property, right? You know what I mean? Like when I'm at home in the house or on the property itself, like I'm faithful and I'm loving and I do what I need to do around the house. But once I'm off the premises, then I can behave like everybody else, right? Like all my bachelor friends and like tell the potty mouth jokes and chase skirts and, right? Not so much. It, Colleen's just loading her shotgun as we speak, right? But why would it be any different for Christians? How is it that we can be different in here and then different? We can't be like, praise you, Jesus, people in here, and then outside, like we're driving our cars like idiots, or we're telling other people that they're idiots for the way they're driving their car. We watch the same trash television. That would be inconsistent, right? That would be inconsistent. That, That doesn't work. Being a Christian has everything to do with us paying our taxes, everything to do with, you know, participating in this election, waiting patiently at red lights, waving people on, being generous tippers at restaurants. Please, Christians, don't be cheap tippers at restaurants ever. It, it, it means not using language to fit in with the crowd, but actually language that would reflect the, the purity that Jesus has called us into in a manner worthy of the gospel. In a manner worthy of the gospel. So it doesn't do to be a Christian and then be the rudest parent on your kid's hockey team, yelling at the coaches, yelling at the refs, telling your kid how she or he lost the game on the drive home. It's just not the way we roll. Christians, in a manner worthy. So not angry. Not angry. Not angry around all this COVID stuff with people who disagree with us, right? Not angry. Not not ever. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. So gospel. It's kind of a church word. Like you all got masks on, so I would ask, does anyone know what gospel means? And if you could muffle it through your mask, you'd say, good news. Thank you. Good news. It means we're a good news people. Christians are a good news people. Everything about us says, I got good news. I got great news. So I think about believers that we're partners with in the Dominican Republic. It's a beautiful group of people, and they are convinced that Jesus is good news. So in a place where largely the men in their culture have kind of lost their way and they stand around a lot and the women really drive the, well, they drive society, but they have to hold the houses together and all those sorts of things. In that cultural context, the church that we're partners with is calling men out and into leadership. Hey, step up and into meaningful lives. It's beautiful, good news people. Thank you, Jose and Gloria. Knock it out of the park again. Good news, people in Dominican. I, I, I don't know. I've never been to Ghana. I hear these stories about Ghana and the Christians who are there and how they rallied around to build a hospital. And not just for their own like church people, right? But for everybody, the Muslims, the animists, the, the Christians, whoever it is. And they're, they're doing a job of excellence, doing it well. And, and they're coming alongside moms and infants. It's really quite spectacular. Just in the last, like, Lenita would be able to tell you better, 10, 15 years or something like that, they, they've been able to come alongside Um, moms and baby infants and reduce child mortality rates ridiculously. I think Lenita Lenita said something about the the UK child mortality rate is the same now as it is in Ghana. It's a a beautiful thing. It was these Christians that came up with this stuff and how to uh, take fluid out of babies' lungs and then checking in with them first day and third day and fifth day because babies often die in the first week there. It's beautiful. Good news, people, keeping babies alive. 
good news people doing wells and whatever in Malawi, right? Good news people. I think about the Sudanese pastors that we worshiped with a number of years ago. They, they have this joy that just comes out their skin. It's spectacular. And you'd never know, watching them interact with each other, high fives and hugs, that, that they're under threat, that they've had their churches bulldozed, that their houses have been targeted and hit with rockets, literally, that their kids um, are at risk. Some have even fled the country. You wouldn't know it in talking to them because they're laughing and they're hugging. You actually think that they're comparing who had the biggest lottery win. It's a beautiful thing. They're good news people. I think about a group of people that we sat down, Christians, good news people in Mongolia, and they served us yak knuckle soup in styrofoam cups after worship. Mm, not so yummy. Oh, they just were glad that we were there, and they told us about the stories around what was going on in their town and how the alcoholism rate was over 50%, which was largely all the men, and how, what they were doing to come alongside, well, in this particular case, they were coming alongside young men, boys, and playing hockey with them and pointing them to a hope that was something a bottle would never give them. It's this beautiful picture of good news people living out their good news hope in front of their, their culture. It's brilliant. Standing in one spirit, striving together as one for the good news. So you know, right, these verses are also about us. They're also for us, this standing as one, this striving as one, this working together as one. I, I love it. I'm inspired by these kinds of things. Unity means all together. I want to just tell you I'm struggling with this. I'm struggling with this all together stuff because it feels like we're so far apart these days. Right? And just us with masks on, and st- which we got to do, and it's right and good, and I'm glad that we're here. It's just maybe, maybe in the last year you've never felt more distant from your church, more dif- distant from the people that, that share the same hope and faith that you've got. It's, it's a struggle. And then if you're, if, you're, if you're there at home, and you've got to feel a little distant from us here, and even those of us here feel a little distant from each other, we're like, can't hug you kind of yet, and it's just, it feels a little bit off these days. I got, I'm going to just say this. That's why, now I know this seems like a shameless plug, that's why we're just dogs on the bone about you joining a small group. Do everything you can. I know it's troublous for some schedules, but do everything you can to put both feet into a small group and plug in there and be back and forth, whatever it takes. Share your hope. Kindle the fire. Don't sort of get separated from, from one another. I'm, I'll tell you, I'm also struggling with this standing as one in one spirit, right? Because we're, we're not together on how best to love those people in our church and in our community who identify as LGBT or Q. We're not, we're not in the same headspace on that. We're, we're not on the same page on vaccines. Right? We're not on the same page on some things that kind of matter right now to, to a lot of people in our time and in our culture. So I thought, like, let's at least do this. Let's nail down what we are 100% together about and we trace ourselves back to the same thing that got Christians in trouble 2,000 years ago, and it's that statement, Jesus is Lord. That's what we're all together on. Jesus is Lord. We dare to believe that Jesus of Nazareth is God in a human body, that this has never, ever happened before, and it's never, ever happened since. This is the one and only. And we believe, because the Bible says so, that he is king overall, that he is king, and he has a kingdom. It's an everlasting kingdom. And we believe that one day... Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is king. And we believe that there's a time coming when Jesus will return. Yes, he will. And there will be a great resurrection. And the way the Bible says it, the righteous to new life and those who refuse to believe to judgment. And we believe that right now women and men believe this to be true. They join the kingdom. They believe the good news. They join this. And they themselves become good news. Little good news starts, as it were, into society, places where you're a teacher, where you're a student, where you're a doctor, where you're into construction, you're an electrician, into these places where you are good news in that spot where God has you planted. It's a beautiful picture, right? Striving together as one. We believe that that's God's plan for us. And so, we're going to have to give each other some space around the LGBT and Q issues, always agreeing together that everybody gets loved and that everyone is equal. We're going to have to give each other space on vaccine issues. We're going to have to give each other space to work out political party preferences. All of this under the lordship of Jesus. 
Jesus is Lord. Let's find our way together. Stay together. Stay together. So I'm not going to say that you never ever change churches because sometimes that's just a, a reality. It's not the best. We'd love to just see people hunker down and stay where they're at. But sometimes theology shifts on essentials. Um, sometimes, you know, Christian have, Christians have relationships that break down and they just can't, for the best of us, mend or repair. Right? Sometimes you just want to worship closer to home. So we get it. I'm just saying this. Never ever give up on us, us. That's the church of Jesus Christ. Whatever flavor or brand that is. Stay together. Here's another thing about us, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose us. Jesus is Lord isn't always greeted with open arms. Jesus is Lord, not so much. People sort of chafe at that. They don't like it. The religious people of Jesus' day didn't like it very much either. Romans didn't like it. Jesus can be our Lord. Sure, just join the, le- join the long line in the pantheon. You can be part of the picture, but you can't demand on being the picture, the story. It chafed them the exclusive claim to power, the exclusive claim to worship, right? And it chafes people in our day. You're going to get pushed back if you believe that Jesus is Lord. How dare you? How arrogant of you? You're like, who can make such an absolute claim? Jesus is Lord is hard for many people to swallow. But you stay the course. You hold on to the truth and don't be afraid. And can I say it this way, Christian? Hold on to it sweetly. Not, not, not military-like, not, not angry-like. Hold on to the truth sweetly so that when people oppose us, that we still come off to them as good news people, as gentle and as sweet. We don't demand our rights. We know how to laugh. We know that there's going to be opposition. We can take things in stride. Here's a, here's a bit of a troubling verse. This will be a sign to those. This is the sign, your fearlessness. This will be a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, Right? When, when you are fearless, you're saying that there is something stronger than fear at work in your life, something more powerful. It's quite interesting. But it does sound a little heavy, doesn't it? They will be destroyed. I don't know all of what that means. I mean, it seems pretty clear to me what that means in the end. But I do know this, and this is the part that matters here. The way a sign works is it's supposed to bring about change. This will be a sign. The sign is supposed to make you do something different. So when you see a stop sign, in theory, it will change the speed. X, follow me here. Change the speed of your vehicle. Right? A stop sign does this. Right? You got the little light that comes on on your dashboard. It's time to change the oil. You got water underneath the sink. Right? It's time to change something in the piping or maybe a tap or something like that. So when Christians stay together, when they stay sweet, when they hold on to Jesus, it's a sign to the world. It's an invitation to the world to change and to get on this page to, to find where the truth really is, who the truth really is. We're a sign that's intended to invite others to change. And then he says this little line, and you will be saved. And that by God. I love that he does that. And you will be saved. And that by God. What's he saying? He's saying, just in case you Christians ever think you're better than somebody else, well, well I'm just smarter than. No, no. Any salvation is a gift of God. Jesus did it, right? We're not smarter than anybody else on the planet, right? We didn't do something to get saved. It's by God. Jesus did it himself. Christians can't get up on a high horse and look down at anybody. We're beggars. We found food. God showed us where the food is. We just want to invite people to the same pile of food that we've got. Okay, last thing. It's been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. That's a tough one, isn't it? Because we'd rather go through life without suffering. We were kind of hoping that. Loving Jesus would mean all that suffering stuff would go away. Our parents wouldn't get sick and our kids wouldn't go sideways and we would keep our job and we would sort of hope that suffering wasn't going to come our way. I mean, this is specific to being a Christian and you should know that if you are a Christian that there will be some suffering. Uh, don't, don't have that play out because you're poking people in the eye with all your Bible verses. That's not the intention. Don't, don't be annoying. But just because you're a Christian, there will be opposition. But we also know that as Christians, there's suffering that gets involved. And some of the people back in Philippi, it looks like because Paul's trying to say, hey, I didn't get a get-out-of-jail card free, chief free card myself. Some of the Christians back in Philippi were already saying, well, good Christians never suffer. If you were a good Christian, you wouldn't have to go through this. If, if, you, if God was listening to your prayers, you wouldn't have trouble. That's not it at all. Please hear me. Suffering comes to all of us. 
and maybe especially to those who lean in closest. But Paul is saying, it's normal. I'm suffering. It's normal for a woman or for a man who believes in Jesus to suffer. Okay, I've got one last point, but I'm going to do like a second last, last point. I just want you to know, those of you who are really deep in some struggles right now, in some suffering right now, that I've never ever once seen God waste suffering. So you're in a bad spot, the worst. Some of you have been through worse things you could ever have imagined for yourself. And I want you to know this, that we worship a God who can take things that were intended for evil and use them for stunning good. And so if you're right under a rock right now, you just need to hear that. God has never wasted suffering. I've seen human beings waste suffering, but never ever God. Even, even stuff that we bring on our own head, not just stuff that's done to us, but even foolish things that we do that we then suffer for. I've never seen God waste that. Take heart, be encouraged. God's not done with whatever you're suffering through. Okay, the last, last point is this. This is the punchline, right? Unity, together. Let's do this. Let's stay together. Whatever, whatever it takes, let's figure out how to encourage each other. Let's pick up the phone. If it's been a while, let's, let's get together with one another. Let's find a way to trust Jesus together. Let's do Mongolia together. Let's do Ghana together. Let's, let's do Malawi together. Let's do this together, the Dominican Republic, because that's what God's called us to as good news people. Let's pray. Thanks, Jesus, for these words. Man, yeah, your idea, your idea, and you do the impossible. It's, uh, we look around the room, and I mean, I'm personally glad to see everybody, but we look around the room and say, without you, I don't know that we would choose these people for, for friends, and, and you have actually made us family. So we say thank you. Thank you for your word, for your encouragement to us, for your invitation to us to change, through us to change. We would ask, in your strong name, Jesus, your spirit, I would ask, into these women, into these men, going through all kinds of things right now in our day and age. And I pray that they would know your deep assurance, your presence with them, and your kindness to them. In your name I pray. Amen. Okay, friends, I'm going to invite you to stand. I want to speak a word of blessing over you. If you're really nuts and you're at home in your living room in your flannel pajamas and you want to stand up, that's okay too. This is the heart of God towards all of you. It's grace, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the friendship of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and tomorrow and forever. Amen.